This chapter is going to introduce you to data analytics and accounting. So let's talk about the goals of this chapter. The first one we're going to talk about is what exactly makes a good question that you can actually answer with smart frameworks. So we'll talk about kind of what makes a question good and what each of those elements stand for. We'll talk a little bit about ETL. ETL is what's called extract, transform, and load process. How do you get data out of a system and into a right format for analysis? The next thing we're going to hit are the four levels of analytics. And this is actually a really important idea about what can you actually answer or not when you work through some of these data analytic pro projects. We'll talk a little bit about data visualization. And again, we'll tie in in class more with Excel, talking about what makes a good or a bad chart in Excel. And then a bit more about automation as well. All right, so let's talk about the kind of high level, right? What is this talking about and why does it matter? I think the best way to think about this is to compare it to something else. Think about your other quantitative classes like statistics, algebra, or calculus. In a normal mathematics class like algebra, you're given an equation, you know, solve for x. In a statistics class, you're given usually some kind of probability question, or you're given some kind of experimental design, maybe you calculate a p-value. Analytics is a bit different. We are dealing with much less rigorously and well-defined problems. And actually a big part of it is just to figure out what question do we want to answer? And do we have the data to even do that? So this is really about using real world data to try and solve some kind of problem. It's usually really about a particular situation. We're not as concerned with generalizable knowledge like we are in statistics. Think about statistics, how you can go online and look at a poll for who's gonna win in the presidential election. And that's because they drew a sample, they asked some questions and they tried to figure out some extrapolation. Here, it's not really about that. Here, it's sort of getting into a particular company's problem trying to find out what are the right questions to ask. You're going to do the ETL process to try and be able to find what's the data available for me. Then you're going to do some kind of visualization or statistical technique, and then you're trying to share those results with stakeholders. So it's a very different kind of process that we're going to replicate in our in-class activities. So what are the key skills here? So this is a nice table from EY talking about what they recommend their new hires have for data analytics skills. So at the basic level, we're doing things like ratio, sorting, aggregation, trends, right? These are basic things we're going to play with inside of Excel. You say, you know, who are our top 10 customers? Uh, how many sales do we make in this sort of area over here? And we're going to do some this work inside of Excel. This is your primary tool as a person in business. Everyone has Excel. Everyone uses Excel. It's a great tool. We might also do a little bit of visualization work with something like Tableau or other elements there. Now, once you get a little more into this, we start doing some more fancy stuff. This is some statistics things. So statistics we're looking at is like, what are the clusters? Um, is this a valid sample or not? Can I infer something from this to a larger population? What things correlate with each other or regression? It's a little more higher knowledge. We don't get to it as much in this class. That's sort of the follow-up courses that you can get into. We also see more specific pieces of software. So you might have specific packages used for forensic or for tax. We also will deal a little bit more with SQL. The SQL query language is a way of accessing databases. Now, at the higher level, we're talking about some of the newer stuff like AI, um, you know, neural networks, large language models, and things like actual programming languages like Python or R, which is used in some of the upper division courses here. So as a sort of entry-level person, they expect that you're really good at all these things on the left-hand side, all the mastery stuff. They expect that you can do some of the middle things. It's not necessarily your specialty, but you know that it exists and you could probably Google it. And they know that you can talk and a little bit of awareness about some of the things that are on the right-hand side. If you really enjoy this data analytics work though, think about moving your way from the left side to the right side. We have a ton of classes at WVU that teach you these upper level techniques and there's some really exciting things. So if you're kind of getting enjoying this sort of work, then think about deepening your skill set. You think about what classes these are being done in. 
321 really focuses on the black box. Accounting 425 is going to focus more on data visualization and databases. And accounting 426 really deals at the upper right corner over here with some of the more advanced statistics and techniques programming in R. So anyway, great classes. If you're interested, look at that. I'd also highly recommend, if you're interested in this kind of work, look at the Buddha Miner. So the Buddha Miner is a program we offer at WVU where you take a bunch of classes in this sort of data analytics area. Uh, they're taught by a bunch of different faculty, and it's a great thing to add to your overall career. A lot of students in accounting default to doing the finance minor, which is a great minor, but you might think about trying to give yourself something a little special, and so do something that's not quite as normal for an accountant. I think a CIS background or minor is a great way to kind of set yourselves apart a little bit in the hiring process. So now that you're in a company, think about how do you go through this process? Well, the first part is being good about asking questions. And so we use this acronym called SMART. Specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and timely. A lot of times when we ask questions, they're just too broad. They're not focused enough. So specific means that it's a thing that is something relevant to my situation that is going to be useful in some way. We don't ask big general questions like, why is the sky blue? Um, we're going to focus on, you know, what color a product sells best in this location. Measurable, can we answer it with data? There's a lot of questions out there that are just too broad and you really can't get at. So like, is blue a good, is blue a good color? Well, that's, that's too broad. We can't do anything with that. Uh, do consumers buy blue at higher rates than others? Now that we can actually answer. Achievable, it is easy to get sort of sucked into data and just spend a ton of time looking at things, but make sure you are able to do something with the result. So we talk about consumer preferences. You might find that consumers really like the process of making their own colors. Well, that's maybe not achievable with your current production process. You might have to pick the top three colors. Relevant, uh, you need to think about what the organization is trying to accomplish and how your project ties into that. And then timely, we want to make sure that this is set to some kind of deadline. What period do I care about? This could mean saying I'm only going to look at data from the last two years in color usage rather than the last 30 years in color usage. It could be saying I want to focus on this quarter sales to boost next quarter sales, but you want to kind of tightly define. So we can think about applying SMART. So say that you're a tax professional, you're trying to meet with a new client to help them make some tax planning decisions. Now when it comes to tax planning, we can choose a variety of positions, either a very aggressive or very conservative. So you might think about how will we assess a client's appetite for taking aggressive versus conservative tax positions. So think about some questions, right? How can we make these questions specific, measurable, achievable, or actionable, relevant, and timely? So let's do question one. Is this a good tax question? Well, it's not super specific or measurable. It's kind of pushy, actually. You might think it is relevant, Timely, I assume it's applying to the today's one as well. But think about ways you could kind of redesign this. And so in class, we'll sort of work with a couple more of these questions and talk through some of these as a breakout. ETL. So once we have some good questions, we want to go ahead and think about how we can get the data out of whatever system it's in now, transform it into a better version, a more useful version, and then load it into my analysis toolkit. So this is really a time-consuming process. It's probably the most time-consuming of any part of this data analytics work because most of it is really going to be on transforming the data. Most data in the real world has a lot of problems. Data is generally collected just as a means to an end, and so when you take that data and try to then use it for a different project, you find a lot of issues or inconsistencies with it. We do want to try and automate this process, and so there's toolkits out there that will automate it for you. What this looks like usually is some sort of legacy system. So in other words, you have a plan a point of sale system. You can work in the system and you'll have an option to export data, usually at what's called a CSV or some kind of Excel file. Sometimes in newer organizations, we instead have databases. So these are systems that are more modern, more up to date that we can attach our analysis toolkit directly into to get our data out of. We also on the very high end have what's called a data warehouse. Data Warehouse is a system set up just for analysis. And so typically you have people in, the, in your company that will periodically pull information out, clean it up, get it ready to go for you. So let's look at some examples. 
These are three different what's called flat file exports. In other words, they give us a table of data that is put into a single text file. We'll usually have these terms, delimiters and qualifiers. So what does this mean? Well, a delimiter says, how do we limit each field? So my first example here, I have my delimiters are the pipe symbol. So I have my first name, my last name, performance score, and then my text qualifier are in quotes. And the reason why I have both of these, I need to know where each field starts and stops. But then I also have these long fields. And with the long fields, I could have the pipe symbol in there. And so I'm going to put quotes at the beginning and the end to sort of show that this is all one piece of information right here. We can have other ways of delimiting this. We can have tab characters. This is another really common way we sort of put uh, space in between each thing. It might be fixed to have the same length. There's a lot of options here. Probably the most common though are going to be commas. So comma is usually we call it a CSV or a comma separated values file. And a CSV is gonna have a bunch of fields and a comma between each one. And usually we're gonna have quotes to sort of say where a field starts or stops. And down here you can tell with Renee Armstrong why we need these text qualifiers. The qualifier starts at the word smiles and ends at technique. If I didn't have this in place, the computer would think that these commas in the middle are part of a new field. Practically what'll happen is you open this up in Excel. If you don't set it correctly, you end up with some of the fields being in the wrong column. And so you'll see some data kind of gets pushed over a little bit. And usually if you work on it a little bit, you can fix that by doing some processing with Excel or in your text editor program. Okay, so those are flat files, basic text values that we import into a program like Excel or Tableau. It may also connect directly to tables and database. So here are some examples of a very simplified ERP system that might have a table with customers, with orders, or details. And the key challenge here is you're gonna to have to write queries with SQL, SQL, that will then connect the data and gets it into the format that you actually want. Sometimes what you also have is called the data warehouse. The data warehouse is when someone's already gone through the work of looking at these data and pulling them into a format that's easier to analyze. So you might have some highly structured data like customer information. You might have less well-structured information like say social media posts or comments on a blog or something like that. So warehouse typically has well-structured information in it. Uh, you might also have subsets of data mart. So you might have one data mart just for the, uh, the, the customer area. So if people who need customer access, they can pull information from that data mart. And then you can get other information like financial data from another data mart or possibly production from another data mart. All right, so once you have it extracted out of the text file or database or data warehouse, you typically need to do some transformation process here. So how this kind of works is you work your way through the data just trying to understand what do we have inside of it. We're then gonna step through a process to standardize structure and clean it up. And this will be identified more in our next chapter where we really practice how to fix information. We then work on validation. Validation is the result of having errors. Maybe someone typed a name in wrong. It could also be something where we change a code over the period of time. So maybe we reorganize our departments and so instead of having by city, now we have by state. So we'll need to go through and make sure that all of those codes are properly changed and coded for the right time. And then we have to document what it is that we did so that we can come back, double check it, and repeat it next quarter. Lastly, we load the data into whatever tool we're gonna to be using. So in Excel, it's as simple as open it up and saving it onto a shared folder or Dropbox or something like that. But if you've got higher end tools like Tableau or Power BI, it might be a little bit more involved. Okay, so now that we have our data, we think what kind of work are we gonna do with this? What kind of outcomes are we gonna look at? We can put this in four different levels, descriptive, diagnostic, predictive, and prescriptive. You can think of it as the what, why, what might happen, what should happen. So first off, descriptive, what happened? This is the question of what does the data just show us happen historically? So if we're trying to look at a company and trying to boost their sales, you say, well, what are our sales? This is the first step. Once you know what the sales are, you can look at them and say, oh yeah, we've got a declining trend here. Then you can get into diagnostic, why? 
Why are our sales down? What is the cause and effect? We really focus on this a lot when we get into the part of the class on competitions. If your sales are down, why? Did your sales go down because you priced badly? Did someone else change their prices? Don't just show me a trend, which is the descriptive. Show me the why. Why did this happen? Now, predictive and prescriptive are higher level analytics that typically involve more stats or machine learning. So with predictive, you say, what do you think is going to happen in the future? So now that you know why things are changing, you can say, all right, sales are down because our prices have risen. If we continue to raise prices, here's what I think sales will be in the future. Then we go to prescriptive, what should be done. What should, think of it like a prescribed, like medicine prescription. I prescribe a medicine to fix some kind of problem. So then you say, okay, if our prices continue to rise, our sales are going to continue to go down. So we should lower our prices and then our, we will get more sales. And so each one sort of sits upon the prior one and you have to do them in order. You can't say what should be done until you've defined what has been done in the past. You can't say what we should do in the future until you say, why is something happening now? So in class, we'll go ahead and look at some of these questions. So if you want to think through and try and figure out what are the different levels of analytics being done for each of these. And then in class, we'll chat about them. Okay, next, we have to interpret our results. Now, we have two terms from statistics, correlation and causation. Correlation says that if one thing happens, another thing tends to happen too. Causation says one thing causes another thing. And it's really easy to misinterpret these two. And so you look at things that happen together and you think that one causes another. The classic example here are placebos. I happen to eat eggs every day and then I feel better. Well, are eggs causing me to feel better or is it just that I'm on vacation so I've got more time to eat eggs, I'm sleeping more and I'm feeling better overall? You can look at some examples of spurious, spurious correlations. So here's an example of divorce rates in Maine versus margarine consumption. Now these look really, really highly correlated, but it's not really meaningful because one doesn't really drive the other. We can also look at how many films Nicolas Cage appeared in versus how many people drowned by falling into a pool. So again, you can see a real strong connection here, but it's not a meaningful cause and effect relationship. Storytelling. When we get into storytelling, we're now trying to take what you've done with your analysis and then broaden it out and convince people to take some kind of action off of it. When we talk about this, it's important not just to snow the person under with data, facts, and charts. We have to figure out what is the question we're trying to answer here? What is the problem? How do, did our work align with that? And we're going to use a lot of data to show that. Now for data visualizations, um, there's a lot of ways to do this. Excel's got a ton of chart options available to us. But we want to think through what's the message we're trying to show here, and then pick the visualization that matches that. So in this class, I put a high emphasis upon using charts well. If you don't use charts like this and slides like this, I will mark you off on presentations. So it's really critical here. Pay attention to what I'm showing you because you'll lose points. First, your first slide needs to have all of the critical information. What's your presentation title? What assignment project is it? What's the date? What's the class? And what's your team name and roles? Don't forget these elements here. All of them are important. And by argue, I mean make the presentation title a claim. Don't just say, you know, presentation won. Instead say, we won because we priced properly. Right? But you need to actually have something you're trying to prove to me. Don't just list things or describe things. Make some kind of thesis statement, just like you would in a writing course. Now, it's not always necessary to have an agenda slide. That's not a bad idea. And this is especially good just to give people a very high level, you know, 10, 15 second overview of what's going to happen in the presentation. When you get into actual charts, I really strongly discourage you from using bullet points. This is a data-driven class, so I want you to use data in your slides and have that drive your presentation. 
So when you use a chart, put the chart title up on top and make it basically fill the screen. Now in most classrooms or presentation rooms, the bottom bit of the slide is not super useful because people can't see it from the back of the room. So it's okay if you want to chop off you know, the bottom third or so of the slide and focus on the top bit. However, make sure that you actually use the slide. Don't just put a tiny little chart in the middle and call it a day, make it large. Now, because I encourage you not to use bullet points, sometimes you might be worried about remembering what you want to say. Well, there's a couple things you can do to help that. First is have good titles. Don't have a title saying, you know, sales by year. That's descriptive, doesn't really tell you much and doesn't tell the audience what you want us to remember. Instead, say something like sales in category four were the highest this year. You can also use annotations. Annotations are a great way of reminding yourself you want to talk about something. You can do that with just a simple little arrow or also do things like highlighting as well. And this box here is just a square with no fill and a border. Really easy to do. When you finish, always have some kind of conclusion. Don't just have the last slide hit and then just stare awkwardly at the audience until someone says something. Have some, some type of closing thought or statement of your thesis, something to say that we should take away X from your presentation. Next, think about thesis versus topic. You need to be able to argue with your work. So don't just say, again, sales for quarter four. That doesn't say anything. That's just a topic. Instead, you need a thesis. Are sales up in quarter four? Are sales down in quarter four? Are sales flat? Why are the sales flat? Get your thesis nice and detailed, and then you'll have a clear idea what you want us to remember about the slide. And my short rule of thumb is if you can't remember what's on the slide, then your audience isn't going to either. So overall, I think this is a great chapter because it really opens up some of the really fun stuff we do in this class. I want all of you to get really good at using Excel, and part of it is becoming problem solvers. And so when we get into data analytics, hopefully you'll start kind of getting engaged in the class, using Excel in this way, and having some fun looking at data.